So, first of all, thank you for joining this webinar today here with Noblu. Um, I've got a brief slide deck to run through. I am conscious of time and I know that people want to see product on these things. They don't want to be going through a heavy slide deck, so I'll whistle through it. Um, in the room with Ryan, you've obviously got myself, John Harfield. You've got Mahdi Abbas, who will be taking over the Noblu account going forward, uh, but he's in training, so I'm training him up. So you'll get to meet him in the fullness of time. And we've obviously got Julian, who is uh, the NetSuite account manager who works alongside the team here at Novoloo. Uh, so safe harbor statement to start with. What this is saying is it's around any future content. To be honest, what I'm showing you is what's already in the product. So this isn't necessarily relevant, but I am meant to show it when we do webinars. So I need to. Um, so yeah, the following is intended to outline our general product direction. It's intended for information purpose only, may not be incorporated into any contract. It's not a commitment to deliver any material code or functionality and should not be relied upon in making purchasing decisions. Development, release and timing of any features or functionality described for Oracle's products remains at the sole discretion of Oracle. Having said that, pretty much what I'm showing you is already product that is already released, so it doesn't remain at Oracle's discretion. So a brief agenda. Um, actually, I, we're not going to be covering NSPB at Sweet Connect. That's already happened. We should have updated that. But we have introductions I've just done, the current state of FP&A, so where we see the marketplace within the NetSuite and no blue sphere of customers, what are we generally seeing the trends are in financial planning and analysis. Then a little bit about what the solution the NetSuite has is, why you would choose it, and then a solution demo. We won't cover the customer stories in this session. It would take us probably over and beyond the hour mark, and I'd rather have questions from the audience instead, but you'll get those in the slide deck there after the meeting, and there'll also be a call to action around a discount and contact details for Mardi. so going forward, you can continue the conversations with Mardi and uh, Julian. So the current state of finance and operational planning as we see it generally within NetSuite customers. Now we pulled together a user group and we tried to highlight how they were feeling about some of these statements by, by putting some indicative pictures. So straight away, not overtly happy. A lot of companies, the general facts from Ventana's research are about 70% of companies still use spreadsheets for their planning, budgeting and forecasting. But what we see here at NetSuite in the slightly smaller market size, Ventana tends to, to focus on enterprise size customers. Certainly in the mid-market, it's actually more like 95%. Certainly most companies we speak to will be doing their budget in Excel, and that comes with it a whole load of problems, which we'll briefly touch on, but I'm sure present company on the call are already aware of. On top of that, companies are generally buried in the basic duties. So that's putting together the template, sending it out, adding up the data, and it doesn't really leave you any time to do analytical work. On, when you couple that with the fact that there's a whole load of process around it, so that is the setting up of the templates, the, the checking your emails to make sure, am I opening the right version of the budget from marketing, from sales, from administration, from professional services, and then bringing it together. That's all process before you then go in through the heavy uh, sort of basic duties of aggregating stuff like a computer, which results in at the very end, only about 20% of finance's time being spent on doing value adds. The other kicker is about 30% of your time we generally see is spent doing reports for the business. So by the time you add in 30% of your time doing reports for the business, another chunk of time spent running processes that you could automate in a system, and then what's like the other main time uh, drain is, is the aggregation of the data without really any analytical work which yeah, is what's results into kind of only one day a week generally being spent adding value in the finance function as opposed to just being a reporting engine or effectively doing the work of a tool such as what I'm going to show you today. So Excel, it's okay, but and you'll probably recognize a lot of these problems. So it can crash, you can go not responding, and you can have the whole proliferation of uh, versions of sheets, I'm sure from some people on the line, this is the kind of thing that occupies budget folders, say that's just the 2019 one, you probably got similar things for 2018, 2017, and potentially for the next fiscal year of FY20 as well. I know I've certainly been in businesses where that is the case, and that's why I moved through to the sales side, was to uh, take my experience from being within departments, from building out software, and basically elucidate or, or talk about the values that it can add and how you can streamline things and get back to finance being not a reporting engine or a, and a computer for the business, but actually doing the value add. So Excel's in effect a little bit of a burning bridge. It, it, it has its job. 
you want to do some a quick ad hoc analysis, Excel is always going to be fantastic for that. As you guys as NetSuite users know, you can pull some data out, you can do a quick analysis. But running a full budget cycle, a full budget process, because it's a process and because there's cycles, in the same way as you, you've migrated to NetSuite for, for ERP or thinking about it, it's exactly the same on the budgeting side. It's moving on from that first software, if you want to call Excel a software, to then progressing to a proper system. So it solves spreadsheet challenges. The primary thing it does is it automates. So that automation can be the pull of actuals from NetSuite to seed budgets. It could be automation of the budgeting templates. It could also be automation of the aggregation, i.e. adding up all the data across different departments, different entities, different currencies. With that automation and the time saved and putting it into a platform, you can also then collaborate. If you've got a platform and everyone's seeing the same version of the truth, it becomes much easier to collaborate. These are things that you'll know well from NetSuite and how it allows you to automate things and collaborate. It's the same messaging here. The other thing with NetSuite is because you've got all that data in one place, because you can collaborate, you then have the time freed up from not doing the process work to analyze. It's the same message. You'll see a lot of synergies between the planning and budgeting methoding, messaging and the ERP, the core NetSuite messaging. With your, with your analysis, you can also visualize that data. So because you've got it in a system, we have graph types, we can say, right, I want to view by department my sales by product. Uh, and I want to compare them, maybe actual budget and forecast as a bar chart, and I'll show you a little bit of that later on, but the demo won't be exhaustive, there's plenty more we can talk about. All of that can then be combined in a system which you can manage, you can maintain it, you can set up business rules, processes, reminders, reports, dashboards around it, so effectively your, your month-end, say, board pack, can be pre-automated so it becomes much more manageable so those are kind of the five main things that the software brings there's a whole other array as well but those are the five that we predominantly see our customers wanting to be able to have from a system the ability to automate to collaborate across departments to analyze and to be able to visualize and analyze that data to be able to manage the overall process which leads to a much happier now, not a baby, but a grown-up child, because these things take a little while to put in and to run, and you've got to build the business case. So, of course, the child's got older. It's now a small child, but he's happy, much happier than he was before. So what is NetSuite Planning and Budgeting? I've spoken about how, where it fits in or, or, or what it can bring to a company, but what is the actual product? Well, it's a child of the 1980s, as am I, just. I've only got about 40 days in the 1980s, but I'll cling on to it just for this tenuous link. So these are all great things from the 1980s, but one other thing that came out was something that was voted in Time Magazine's top 10 uh, innovations of the 20th century, which is the, the S-Base Data Cube. Now, some of you may know of S-Base, others may know of Hyperion. So Hyperion is the, the foundation from which the planning and budgeting product NetSuite has available to sell comes from. So it comes from the Hyperion stable, and I'll actually even show you uh, when I'm in the demo where it's still called out in the web address that I go to it still actually even says Hyperion planning so Hyperion and S-Base are well known in a broader array of finance functions across multiple industries it's got a very strong brand name still because it was of its time it was a very very powerful product Oracle has since moved that on-premise product to the cloud and it's uh, handed over the keys if you like to that engine to NetSuite and we're now tuning that to not just fit very very large companies such as your HSBCs, General Electrics, Unilevers, I'll come to a logo slide in a bit, but also more NetSuite sized companies. So things more like Typeform or Fisherwack or uh, GoCardless. Again, the logos are coming up shortly. So the NetSuite offerings, if you use NetSuite, you'll be aware that you can hold a budget, but basically you're building that in Excel and you're loading it in. It's there for a comparative purpose in NetSuite, but that's pretty much it. You can have advanced financials or financial management, which lets you have multiple versions of that budget, and potentially you can uh, allocate out some expenses, but that, that's pretty much it. Whereas NetSuite planning and budgeting comes with a much wider array of functionalities. It's a full-blown planning and budgeting platform. Um, it's not just a, a data field or a data uh, repository inside of NetSuite. It's a completely separate platform in which you can do driver-based planning, you can do trend-based forecasting, you can do modeling, analysis, dashboards, etc. So what does planning and budgeting from NetSuite deliver? 38% less time in the planning process, 
That is a combination of time saved from generating spreadsheets to aggregating data. And if you think about that in real terms, that's a day and a half a week, roughly, which is quite a lot of time back. So you think about if you had all of Monday and half of Tuesday freed up just by having a system in, it, it, it starts making sense as to why you might move towards a planning and budgeting system. Once you've got the data in and less time in the planning process, it then makes it easier to do your management reports as well. So because that data is in and everything's flowing and you've got calculations that are set up, when you bring through the latest actuals from your month end close, it can then flow straight into your management report. So all you need to do is think about changing it from say, if we're looking at the moment, you probably closed, just recently closed the books for October. You'd previously have had the management pack for September. You want to update it. All you might have to change is one field from say September to October and then you'll see the latest management reports. Rather than having to build something, reconcile all the numbers, make sure it all lines up. And what we see overall is this leads to a 12% increase in forecasting accuracy. This can mean a couple of different things. It might mean actually your difference between your forecasted value and what you actually get is decreasing, or it could mean that actually uh, the overall aggregation of the data is happening better and faster, so the numbers at the top are adding up quicker, and that's increasing the accuracy because you can deliver it quicker. The overall aim of the game is to plan, report and forecast faster, which allows you to maximise the return on your investment in your software systems by leveraging NetSuite planning and budgeting on top of your NetSuite environment. So the why, we've covered the, the, what it delivers. The why, it's a market leading product. It has been for the last 10 to 15 years. We could bring up a whole load of old quadrants. Oracle has remained a leader in all of them. SAP and IBM have come and gone, they've had their time, they're starting to slide off. You've seen the rise and now plateauing of uh, Anaplan and uh, Adaptive slash Workday. Host Analytics is doing something similar, but the one constant in the planning and budgeting space is Oracle NetSuite, which is why it's the most widely adopted product. So talking about that wide adoption, the product launched into the cloud in 2014. Uh, so far it has about 4,500 customers, potentially soon going to be 5,000 odd. We're not sure exactly when that's going to happen, but it's coming soon. This is across the whole Oracle estate, so that includes what we're selling at NetSuite. Um, in many countries, many industries, and many, well, this, this number has got significantly higher recently, many subscriptions. So here's some of Oracle's logos. You can see a very wide array of industries are covered from publishing houses such as Pearson to, say, Reading Borough Council to Santander Bank through to someone like Coca-Cola. That's four or five very different industries there, and there's many more logos besides for Oracle's planning and budgeting. But if we come down, we'll take a look at NetSuite's planning and budgeting snapshot. We're up to about 600 customers in just over two years of selling the product. That shows how much demand there is in the NetSuite space, which was why Oracle gave us the keys to that engine, as I said earlier. We've so far got about 6,000 users globally running it, We've sold it into, uh, the last time I updated this slide it was 10, but we've just sold into two new countries this month. So that's at least at 12, and that's just in EMEA. I don't know about, say, Africa, LATAM, and JPAC. I know they're always expanding into new territories. And the industries are still roughly about 10. Again, there's probably been some flex in that as well. But here's some of our logos. So you can see on here, they're again across an array of industries. You've got uni places who do, say, student accommodation. You've got ESMO, which is the European Society for Medical Oncology, and then you've got people like GoCardless and Icon Web as well, and Vivo Barefoot. So there's a whole array of companies that are using this, from software to manufacturing to services and others besides. So what are the differentiators? Why do people choose this product over some of the competitors? The first is the integration capability. The integration is owned by NetSuite in the same way as if you have a, a, a suite app or something where you're using a third party that links with NetSuite, we're going to maintain that integration because it's all by NetSuite. We're always going to update and have the latest and greatest releases to bring through new features from both planning and from the ERP side to, to keep the two systems integrated. That's not just it though, the integration capabilities of planning and budgeting are very wide because it's a, a process that takes a lot of inputs from different parts of the business, we also recognize you often want to integrate with an HR system, maybe a field services system, maybe a professional services system. So it's an open platform. It comes with a data management tool, which enables you to make many different connections. So integration, there's a lot of options. And I will be showing the integration with NetSuite in the demo. It's scalable, as shown by the NetSuite logos and then some of the 
multinational Oracle logos, it will fit any size of business. The product can scale, so as you grow in the same way you can grow your NetSuite estate, you can grow your planning and budgeting alongside it. It will keep pace. It can scale to be a very, very large product covering hundreds if not thousands of users in hundreds of countries. The flexibility of the tool. I'll show you some of the flexibility, the different ways of reporting, the easy ways you can slice and dice the data, change dashboards, etc. The reporting capabilities. You can report from the web, you can report from Excel, PowerPoint, Word, PDF. I'm yet ready to find a way you can't report out of it, if I'm honest. And the fact that underneath all of this, it's a single vendor. You're just having to deal with NetSuite. If you go for the other solutions in the leader quadrant, generally you're going to have a different ERP platform and a planning platform, which means there's always an integration problem. Are the two going to be maintained? And all the questions that come with things like that. So that was the PowerPoint deck. I'm now going to jump into the planning and budgeting demo. So let me just get to my internet. So I'm going to start off on a NetSuite dashboard. That might seem slightly confusing. Why would I start in NetSuite if I'm talking about planning and budgeting? Well, the basis for virtually all planning and budgeting is the company's actuals. So you need to have your actuals flowing through to somewhere. NetSuite is the system for the actuals for the majority of yourselves. I know there are some that are still considering it, but hopefully you would go with NetSuite. Regardless, we can integrate it with other systems, so it's not a problem, but I just want to showcase the integration capabilities. So I'm on a NetSuite dashboard. I can get out to planning and budgeting up here. I could have it in my favorites under the star, or in my case, I'm just going to click this link on the right hand side. It's going to take me out to a, a planning and budgeting environment. This is uh, loading up our starter environment. Now, starter is designed as just that. It's a starter. It's a baseline, a bit like with NetSuite, mm -hmm. where you, you start off with a, a core implementation, then you add on extra functionality. This is exactly the same approach with planning and budgeting. It's not to say it's all we can sell. There are many other things. And if needs be, we can organize follow-up demos to go into much more detail. Equally, if there's questions around, can it do this or can it do that, please ask them through the chat. We will answer them at the end. So I've come through to planning and budgeting. It looks and feels different. I've mentioned kind of one platform. It is a separate database. It is that Hyperion database. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a few minutes. But first of all, I want to find some actuals in my budgeting system, in my forecasting system. And I want to be able to query them to check, has that, where's that number come from in NetSuite? Can I surface that number in planning and budgeting and also inside of NetSuite? So I've come through to an income statement report. I'm viewing it for one subsidiary within my company. And at the moment, I'm viewing it across all my departments, so very high level. I can see my actuals. This has come from NetSuite, and I'm going to drill through on some of these numbers and go back into NetSuite to prove this to you. And my forecast I've built in here, and I'll take you through how we build that in just a minute. For the drill through, though, I want to come down to a lower level of detail. If I drill through from all of my departments, I've got, say, 10 different departments in this company. I would see lots of lines of data. I'd rather filter it down to just, say, one department. So I'm going to come to this report a little bit further along on the top. So here I've come down to just viewing the data for the administration department and just viewing a given class of transactions. Recognizing the class in most instances becomes something else than companies. It could be a project dimension, a cost code, a profit center, uh, a categorization of transactions. All of this segmentation at the top would mirror your NetSuite environment. But here I am in the administration department. I've got a series of figures in front of me. Because I'm going to be drilling back to NetSuite, I don't have anything in the forecast. The forecast is held in this tool, so it's not going to have been fed from NetSuite. So obviously I can't drill through to it. But if I pick these lines here, say I pick training expense here in February 28188, and I want to drill down on that. If I right click, I get a series of options. Now, the only one I'm concerned about at this point in the demo is the drill through. So I'm just going to drill through to my source document, and this will load up an intermediate screen for me. And I'll pause here for a second. What I see is this top box is planning and budgeting, and we were drilling through on training expenses. The bottom box is my individual transactional line items that have gone through inside of NetSuite. So I said we were talking about training and expenses. When you do the budget on, say, OPEX, you generally are going to plan an amount to be spent by month or an amount that people are allowed to spend. You might do it by quarter or by year, but the point is there's an amount. You don't necessarily know all of the individual transactions that are going to happen. 
you might just say you've got a training budget of £90,000 for the quarter or £30,000 for that month. And then people will go away and utilize that in whatever way they see fit. It could be one training course for everyone in the department. It could be four or five little training courses. So in budgeting, we just have one number. But when we transact it in NetSuite, we have multiple different lines. So if it's one training course, one line. If there's four or five, I'll have my four or five different lines. That's the difference between the databases. In planning and budgeting, I just want the sum of my transactions because when I do my budget, I don't budget at transactional level. Equally, when you do a forecast, you're normally forecasting at that high level and not going into individual transactions. But NetSuite as a system of record has every single line item. So this is where we see them. And if I wanted to check that transaction in NetSuite, I can click the cog to drill right back through to my source system. And what this is doing is it's now building a saved search on the fly inside of NetSuite. It's taking the segmentation that I had from planning and budgeting. So what I had in this top box here, all of these segments, and it's building a saved search to surface that data inside of NetSuite. Here are my four transactions. And if I wanted to go down and interrogate those further, I could click on view and go down and see them. I'm an administrator, so I can also do edit. Obviously for your actuals, you wouldn't normally be able to edit. The period would be closed and locked. So that covers off at a high level the integration. Um, I'll also quickly, if time allows at the end, show the integration from Excel. We have an Excel plugin for, for um, planning and budgeting and you can drill through from there as well. So I'm gonna come back to planning and budgeting here. I covered in this income statement the actuals and I've just shown where they can come from. But I mentioned the forecast and I said we're building up a forecast in here. So let's take a look at that now. So I'm gonna use the navigator in the top left hand corner and you can see income statement balance sheet and cash flow. It kind of gives me a black background for where I am currently. For now, I'm going to take a look at my OPEX. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to see that training expense amount, the 28188 that I drew through on in February. But I'm also going to be able to see what's forecasted out. So I come through at the moment to an OPEX report, a total department. If I wanted to see it for an individual department, I can click on this drop down. I can select, say, the administration department, which is where I was before. And when I drill down to that level, we will see that my actuals here will reflect what I saw in my income statement. So training expense 28188, it's the same sheet I drilled through on before. But now I want to look at the forecast numbers. How am I building that up? So I'm going to go through to the actual planning page. So here I am. I've got my account lines down the left. You'll straight away notice these two columns and then a grayed out area. So the grayed out area is my actuals data. The 28188 I've just drilled down on is still flowing through right here. It's actually 28187.57, which is exactly the same number that I had here. So we're still looking, I can't see it because I've got my webinar controls in the way, so just let me move them for a sec. 28187.57, we can see I'm looking at the same data just through a different lens, through a different sheet. Now what we have in here is a forecast of that going forward. So if we continue with my training expense line here, we'll see I've set a forecasting method. And in this case, I've picked nine months rolling. Now I might want to change that. I might say, well, we've hired a load of staff in the last six months. I don't want to include the last three months in my forecast. I just want to take a rolling six looking at staff training costs. So I'm going to change that to a rolling six. And I might decide I'm not going to increase the budget by 12.5%. It might just be 5%. I get a yellow background. If I hover on it, it will tell me why. It's saying uh, this cell has been modified. And at this point, the yellow background tells me it's been modified, but it hasn't been submitted to the database. I can make changes on my manual line at the same time. So if I change this and make it, say, 4,000, it will change to a yellow. It will also change the total for the year and aggregate things up. So again, I can enter another cell here, another 30,000. It's making changes as I go. If I hit save now, it will get rid of the yellow backgrounds. It will submit this to the database. It will also recalculate my training expenses line. So at the moment, we're at 351,867, but I'll hit save and it will now recalculate that based upon a six month rolling average with an uplift of 5% as opposed to a nine month rolling average with an uplift of 12%. So we can now see that's come down to 341,000 from the 360 odd it was before. So you can pick your forecasting method. You can choose to base it on prior actuals. You can choose to base it on trended methods. I'll just show those forecasting methods again. But the predominantly the approach is to take an existing set of data and extrapolate it forward, either as a rolling forecast or just taking, say, last year's data and adjusting it by percent or completely freeform, go through and manually type. 
Now, you might ask what's going on with the green background. When I changed the number, it had a yellow background. So what does this green background mean? Well, if I hover on it, it will tell me this cell contains supporting detail. And if I right click, I can expose that supporting detail. So I'll take a quick look at what is in here. So what we have on this payroll tax and expenses is say some extra information as to where that cost is coming from. <coughs> Excuse me, let's take my throat. What we have is a quantity of laptops and a price at which we're paying for them. So I've got 50 laptops coming through at 900, but what if we get a bulk discount when we buy these? We might get say a 10 to or 15, 20% off. We'll make it say 750 per laptop instead. So when I change that, You'll notice the total changes, the 45,000 is now 37,500. And when I hit save, I can submit that through. So what the supporting detail allows me to do is to put in extra information. If I have some drivers going into a given line, certainly useful on things like projects, if you've got one-off costs that are driven by say price times quantity, you can right click and you can add supporting detail to a cell that will calculate an amount. What we do say though is if it's something you will do regularly, if it's the same in every department, we would potentially say, well, let's look at that in more detail. Let's build some drivers to go into that plan. Instead of my driver being, say, my historical data, your driver could be the quantity of laptops and the price at which you're paying for them. But that would be covered in uh, any follow-up sessions. For now, I'm gonna stick to trend-based for the sake of time. So that's what's going on with the green background. You'll also notice some little triangles in the corner. The astute amongst you will probably think, oh, that looks like Excel, and indeed it does. The little green triangle in the corner means there is a comment behind there. So if I right click on the 3277 in supplies expense and I choose to expose my comment, I can see what the comment is. This is due to an increase in paper for an advertising campaign. So the price is, uh, the cost is potentially higher than we thought, and that's the reason why. And it's got a date and timestamp for when that was put in. So let me just hit close on that. What you can also do is you can see the audit trail behind a number. So if I right click on this again, I'll get the options again. And you notice I've got change history. I can look at my change history. At the moment, there's no change history on there. We'll do it on the one I just changed. So one with supporting detail. We'll look at my change history and we'll see. Uh, we can see what the values have been changed. Um, so you can see the old value, the new value and the date and timestamp. Uh, of when the change was made and also the user that was doing it. So you can keep track of things as they're changing. If you needed to see why is a forecast changed, you can bring up the audit trail and see what's happened there. So that's great. I'm planning for an individual department. As you'd imagine, if you've got multiple departments, you can send out this as a template. And if I want to pivot to see those different views, I can simply click on administration at the top and say, let's pick my operations department or let's actually go for sales. We'll pick the sales department, we'll click OK. It didn't register my click. There we go, select sales, click OK. Push that through with the lid press of the arrow, it refreshes the sheet and I see the data that's relevant for sales. But what if I wanted to see all of my departments side by side? Well, that is the next sheet that I have. So I'll come through to OPEX or departments and here we're breaking out by account code and by department, my planned, my actuals and my planned forecasted numbers on the OPEX side. So as we scroll down, we can see what's going on across all of my different departments. So we can see what's going on. Now, a common thing is that's say great for building up a bottom up plan, but can you do top down as well? Yes, we can. I'll show you a brief example of that. If I come through to the OPEX top level adjustment, I want to set a target from the top and spread it back down over that bottom up plan. So I'm working between the two. So I'm quickly just going to expand it out by department. I won't bother drilling down through the expenses hierarchy. You should imagine there's quite a few layers. It's not great for you guys to watch during a, a live demo. But instead, I've got a value here of, say, 12 million and 44,000. What if I wanted to adjust that? What if I wanted to spread a change over the grid? Well, I can right click and I can go to adjust. And here I've got the ability to do a grid spread. So if I go to grid spread, I could choose to adjust that number and I might adjust it by say, just save $20,000 or 20,000 pounds. But you might also just say, I wanna cut say an extra 2.5% off my costs. So I'm gonna enter in my minus 2.5. I can put the percent there or choose not to. I now hit percent. It will calculate what the 12 million and 44,000 is less 2.5%. It's 11,743,000. Uh, 11, and I want to proportionally spread that over all the populated values 
within the given year of FY19. So I hit apply. I'll give this a second. What it's doing is it's basically building this up from the lowest level account by account. I'm going to have a load of those yellow cells that I was showing you before when I was doing the OPEX on just an individual department level. But across all of my departments, all of my account codes where there's data, it's going to be making an adjustment. And to see that at the highest level now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click save. This will save and refresh my sheet. My sheet. And once that's completed, you'll see my 12 million and 44,000 has actually now become 11.743 million, which is the exact figure I had before when I did that grid spread. So I've made a top-down adjustment. I've got an audit trail behind it so I can see where it's come from. What you can also do is store that in a different version. So you can have a bottom-up version of the plan or a top-down version of the plan. I'm just not exposing that here, but I'll come on to that in a little bit. So that was the OPEX. Great, we've put in our costs, but we also now, in a budgeting process, generally you're going to need to look at some revenue as well, otherwise you, you're not going to balance the books. So let's take a look now at sales and COGS. Now, we, we fully recognize that revenue differs dramatically by company, by industry, and by sort of company ethos. So this is just a, a generic model. If you wanted to see more detail around other models, by all means get in contact uh, with Ryan or Julian or Mardi after this, and we can take you through specific models. But to give you a flavor of what we can do, I'm going to take you through the revenue in here. There's a products-based company. It's selling products to customers. So we have here at the moment um, sales from the given subsidiary from the sales department. I've set that in the background and I'm selling at the moment to one company, which is say Abbott or Abbott Inc, I should say. So at the moment I've sold 153,900 in the month of May and I'm forecasting based upon last year's actuals and we're predicting a 5% uplift in revenue. So that gets me to 161,000. What if I change that to say 10%? then I would expect my 153 to become more like 168. So let me hit save on that. We'll see if it does do that calculation. It's saving, it's refreshing. I've now got my 169,290, which is that 10% uplift. We've also got similar methods, 12 month rolling, nine month rolling. And again, as on, the as on the expense side, sorry, you can do the exact same on the revenue side and you can say three, six, nine, 12 prior year or manual as well. But in here, instead of flipping between department, I can change between my customers. So I'm viewing it at the moment for Abbott Inc. But what if I want to pivot on that? What if I want to pick a different customer? Let's pick, say, Chatterpoint. I'll come through. The sheet will now refresh when I tell it to. The reason I'm doing it when I tell it to is because I might want to change multiple things at once. You can have it to automatically change afterwards. If you're only ever going to be changing one thing, you can make it automatically refresh. That's, again, user preferences. So in here, I've got the forecast for Chatterpoint. You can see it's mostly be done manually. And we've just put in some figures across the given months. So now if I want to look at this instead of by all of my products to individual customers, what if I want to look at one product to all of my customers or a certain segment of my customers? That's what my next sheet is. It's the same data, just pivoted and viewed through a different lens. So we've swapped item and customer dimensions around. So item is now at the top and customer is now at the bottom. So my 153,000 plus my 10% is showing here, and the values I have for Chatterpoint, the 26 odd thousands are showing there. So I can see what is going on across different uh, views. In this view, I've grouped my customers into, say, an enterprise class of customers, but whatever groupings or hierarchies you have within NetSuite will flow through to the planning and budgeting. So if you've grouped them as in this case by size of customer, you're gonna see them as in here, enterprise, mid-market, and SMB. But you might also group them by, say, vertical that your customers operate in, area of the country, services that they're buying from you, you name it. Whatever that segmentation you have in NetSuite will flow through to here. So that's, again, building up the forecast. And I'm conscious that at the moment I've mostly shown you things that effectively look like Excel on the web. So on the sales side, we recognize that, great, it's one thing looking at the numbers in these kind of Excel views. But what about if I want to see some trends of what's going on? It's great putting in the trends, but let's actually look at them. How can I consume all of this data that I'm building up in this, in this database? Well, we've pre-built some dashboards as well. And these dashboards are not exhaustive. They are specific to this kind of company. But we have different dashboards for, say, software companies, services companies, banking companies, products companies, you name it, they differ. So what do I have here on screen now? Again, we're looking at, say, a forecast scenario. We're looking at a given subsidiary. When I come through to the balance sheet and the cash flow, we'll see some data in some different subsidiaries. 
So I'm looking at my total sales by customer and exposing it by customer group. So I can click on enterprise and I can expand that out and I will see beneath it my individual customers. So Abbott, Chatterpoint, et cetera. And in here I'm bringing through my sales from all classes of transactions and all products. So let me just collapse that again. I just wanna see the three lines. So great, I've got a table of numbers. I can maybe see something funky is going on in, in June with my enterprise customers, but other than that, nothing's really jumping out at me. But it's the exact same data that I'm graphing below. And what really stands out to me here is we have a lot of seasonality, things flex up and down quite a lot. But suddenly between September and December, maybe even January of FY19, things go flat. So what's going on with my forecasting method? Is it that actually it's not been done for some customers, so it's appearing flat and I'm not getting my peaks and troughs? Have I put in the wrong forecasting? Well, let's take a look, let's interrogate it instead of by viewing it as an Excel table, let's interrogate it by drilling down on the graph. So we'll drill down on my enterprise customers. And what do we see? Well, we see, ah, we're no longer getting the oscillation in my different customers. So because potentially I'm averaging everything out, I'm losing their buying patterns for these given months. So that might be acceptable. You might decide a blended average is about right because they sometimes they'll buy, sometimes they'll not buy. You know they might buy in the quarter if you don't know exactly which month, so you can average it. But again, depending upon your business, you may actually go, no, we need to have that oscillation between all of my companies. The only thing with this I find is it's really hard to tell which companies are buying when and where because the colors are very similar. So what I can also choose to do is change the visual on that graph. So I can click on the two cogs, get a pop-up, I can change my settings. So I will change the weight of the lines, that might potentially help, but these are all quite close together, so I don't think it will. Instead, I'll swap it to say a bar chart. So I can change my visualization type just like you can inside of NetSuite. So when I hit close on this, it potentially becomes more apparent that we're averaging everything across all my customers here, Whereas generally a customer might buy one month, but then they're not normally buying for the next one or two. So having them with an average value across three really just doesn't make any sense. So when you view things from a dashboarding perspective, you can pick up, I won't say errors, but nuances within your forecast that you go, hold on, that doesn't, I had a CFO once describe it as the number doesn't smell right. It doesn't feel right. Something's not right there. You maybe you wanna go through and revisit it. And you can do that on the revenue or the OPEX side. And just coming to the part beneath, We've taken the same values, but instead of viewing it by month and by customer, we're viewing it by year and by account code through which we're booking the revenue. So we can see most of ours is coming from revenue on products in SMB businesses. Um, and you can see the change overall as the percentage of revenue. So in FY18, it was 43%, but forecasted for FY19, it's 50%. So we're seeing a growth in that SMB product revenue. So that might be, say, a sales manager's view, but you can equally come to a higher level and view it from, say, a C-level view of the sales dashboard. And what we're seeing here is some key KPIs pulled out at the top. Again, these are relevant to more of a manufacturing company, so we can see what's our revenue from services, from products, to give me overall sales. Then we can work out the gross profit, because you've got some cogs in the background, which I know I haven't shown, but could do if it was relevant. Um, and then we're going through to gross profit margin at the very end. Now, this dashboard, if we were talking to a software company, we'd potentially be looking at percentage of churn on customers, renewal rates, renewal upsells, downsells, um, number of users using the software, number of new logos sold in the last quarter, that kind of thing. If it's a professional services or a services business, it might be more around what's the utilization of my people's time, what's that utilization as say a percentage of their overall time or as a percentage of their billable time. So if you take off holidays, et cetera, you could be looking at how many projects have we got out there to complete, what's the forward order book looking like versus what we expected. All of the metrics and the KPIs are business specific. So we've done it from a model company that's in a manufacturing business, so that's what we're showing on here. But by industry, we have different dashboards. So I've covered OPEX and I've covered sales and COGS and conscious of time, I'm quickly now going to cover working capital. So we build up a plan which is basically going to give me an income statement or, or a P&L plan for the business. But we also want to derive, and certainly something we see with a lot of NetSuite customers, is they want to be able to derive a cash flow statement from that forward projection, from that forecast of the P&L. So to do that, we just, in this model, make a few assumptions around, say, days inventory outstandings, how much inventory do I have on hand, any one-off uh, write-offs or any one-off additions or acquisitions that we're making, put those through. 
take a look at our trade payable. So we planned our expenses, we planned for different training courses coming up, but what are the terms on those? How long does it take me to pay? So at the moment I'm modeling that I, I pay off my debts within 35 days. And a similar thing on my trade receivable. So how many days of sales do I have outstanding? How much do we have on kind of the, the um, accounts receivable that we need to go out and collect? And we can model through what the average day sales outstanding is in here as well. These are going to allow me to map through my transactions from my income statement through to the relevant balance sheet or cash flow accounts, depending upon when it's hitting. Obviously, if it's transacted in the month, it's going to go straight to the cash flow. If it's being sold in, say, this month of November, but you're not going to collect payment till December, then it's going to go through and sit as an asset on the balance sheet, and then it will hit cash flow in December instead. So let's take a look through at, say, the balance sheet. So I'm going to come in. You can see I've got my financials, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. I'm going to go to my balance sheet again here. And this is going to load up my balance sheet with a very sort of classic view with my assets then going splitting out by categories. So I've got balance sheet, what's in the bank, what's in my inventory, what's in my current assets, fixed assets, scrolling down then what's in my payables and my liabilities and my equity to then give me my actuals so I can see what's come from NetSuite, but we can also then look at the forecasted values from the P&L that we've done built in here. I'm viewing this from one subsidiary at the moment, but you can get a group consolidated view. So I said this was multi-currency environment and I said I had data in other companies, but I'm conscious I haven't shown it. Now I can start seeing that so I can drill down on say my assets and see what do we have in the way of assets within my different entities. So within Australia, Canada, UK, United States, etc., and we can see how this is being built up. I'm give, looking at it for a given scenario and a given year and a given period. It, here is June. I can equally choose to pivot this and change it to a different month. I can do the same thing on my cash flow. I'm going to come through to the cash flow statement. Again, starting with a cash flow report, looking at one subsidiary, and again, from deriving, starting from net income all the way down to give me. Uh, operating activities, investing, and then financing to then give me an overall uh, net change in cash. When I take the net change in cash, add it to the beginning cash, I'm going to derive my ending cash. Actuals obviously flowing from next week, forecast from what we've built inside of this model. And again, I can split this out by subsidiary and I can view it across, across the group so we can see what's going on Australia, Canada, UK, United States, etc. Now, I'm, I did mention one thing that I haven't shown you so far, which was our smart view add-in. So if I come back to my income statement where this all began, I've got the report here, I've got actuals and I've got forecast. But what if instead of doing an outturn for the month, I wanted to look at, say, July and compare actuals to forecast for that month? All I can do is I can go up to actions and I can kick this out or push it to open it up in smart view. Smart view is the Excel add-in that we have. Um, but in actual fact, I'll probably do it from this income statement report. I'll go to a lower level so I can do an individual department. So let me go to actions. It doesn't matter which sheet I choose to do it from, just generally do it from something in the income statement. Um, I'll scroll down, open in smart view. So this is now going to kick off a, a push to Excel for me. It's going to open up the sheet inside of Excel. I did mention I'd say where the Hyperion name lives on. Well, at the top, in my address bar right here, it says Hyperion Planning. So that's where the Hyperion brand name lives on inside the product. It is in other places as well, but that's the easiest one to show you. But I also want to draw your attention to the name of the environment, EPM0526. That is this cloud environment that I'm in. But when I go through to Excel, I'll also be able to see the cloud environment that I'm in. If I just bring up my side panel, it will give me my connection. You can see it's EPM0526. So if I scroll across to the left, it also still got Hyperion Planning. But EPM0526, it's the same data. I'll put these two side by side briefly. My 449425, 27211281882 on training expenses. That's the same 28188 I drilled through on before. And I did mention I could also drill through from Excel. So I'll show that now. If I hover on the 28188 cell, I get this little pop up appear. So I could view supporting details, put in a comment in here. And this is again going into the database, not into Excel. But if I wanted to drill through, I can click drill through. And this is then going to start pushing out to Excel, uh, to Chrome in this case, that's my default browser. And you'll notice it's going to build me another drill through sheet and I'll toggle backwards and forwards from the one I did at the top of the demo. So here it is, it's just loading up 28187.57. 
This is the one I've had there since the beginning of the demo. You'll see the only thing that's changed is where I've clicked on a line to drill through. If I want to finish that drill through again, I can click and drill through to the source, at which point it's going to push to NetSuite. I'm not going to wait for that to load in the interest of time and to be able to get to questions quicker. I'm going to just let that happen. Within here, I can then go completely freeform on this report. If I go to planning and make this analyze, I can choose to drag and drop my fields and I can basically build the report however I wish it to look. So I might want to, this is normal with the flickering, the not responding. I know inside of Excel it normally means it's broken. If I nest this up here, what I now have is a report where I can say, well, actually, let's just take uh, the administration department and bring it into my field of view. So put it down the side. And then let's say, zoom out on my accounts a bit. So I'm going to go up to say uh, total expenses. So what have we got here? There's a nice summary of my accounts. If I zoom out from the administration department, I can then see that summary across all of my departments. And if I drill down on that, total department, it will give me the breakdown of my G&A expenses by department. So that's what we have in sales, nothing planned in engineering, some more cost in administration, a little bit more in operations. Now I'm starting to build my own reports and forms. So it's very easy to build your own reports by using the smart view add-in. Um, so with that, I'll quickly flip back. It's probably finished. It has indeed finished building my safe search. So I started this demo inside of a NetSuite environment. I've come full circle. I've gone in and out of it a few times and I'm now gonna end the demo back inside of NetSuite and we'll now open up the floor to some questions. I think Ryan has already received a few. So um, over to you, Ryan, to fire the questions from me. Equally, anyone in the audience, send them through to Ryan. We'll do our best to get through them. If we run out of time, we can answer them through email specifically. But yeah, Ryan, what have we what have we had in so far? First question is related to the item type. So it's forecast only for inventory items, or can you also forecast kits, packages, and assembly items? Yes, you can. So I know we were doing it just by the lowest level of item type, but if you wanted to do it by groupings of those, by subsets such as kits, yes, you can do forecasting at that level as well. Um, it's just a question of setup and config. We could go through that in a separate session. Perfect. Are there any further questions on that for our asker? Please do press the follow-up. Can you do planning and budgeting based on statistical accounts? So, for example, headcount, sales, volumes, inflation? Yes, you can. So, we, we did a little bit of statistical accounts in terms of the uh, my inflation column on OPEX. That's a bit like having the, the percentage change. But we recognise that certainly on something like sales and COGS, you wouldn't necessarily just take the sales and project it forward. You might take price times quantity to build it up. And yes, we can go through that. We have many models around that on both the revenue and the expenses side. Um, and yeah, again, that can be covered in, in follow-up sessions. Can a solution also be workforce planning as well as financial? Yes, so that's something we very commonly see, especially in, in NetSuite customers. The majority of the cost for any small business tends to be staff. So planning to add staff, planning what you've got is your salary basis, uh, yes, we can do workforce planning. What we'll do actually is I'll put in some screenshots into the PowerPoint slide that I was going through, and you'll be able to see then what that workforce planning looks like. And again, that's kind of an introduction. It's not the be all and end all. That was a way we've done it for some customers, but we can go to much more level of detail. So that has things like bonuses, pay rise, percents, um, but we can also do things like car allowances, London weightings, medical benefits, etc. It's it's just an example of what we can do. So yeah, we can go to very, very granular detail on workforce or keep it as in this model at a high level, take my workforce amount for a department and just add 5% to it over the coming year. So we can do from very, very simple modeling to much more complex by person, by hourly rate, etc., and build it up. Can you create management reports using a different account hierarchy other than the GL? Yes, so that's another one that we get asked quite a lot. Um, just because you've got your ERP structured in a certain way it often doesn't reflect the board pack. And then finance's job is to take the trial balance, recut it to get to the management figures. So yes, we can do that. If you think about what I had in Excel here, I can choose to expose these in whatever order I want. I can create my own groupings. And as you can in NetSuite, um, with I think advanced financials, you can have multiple roll-ups of a hierarchy. So you can have a base roll-up, but you can also have a management roll-up and you can do that in accounts. 
you could do it in departments, you could do it in products, and that's partly how you get your kits and assemblies, is you choose a roll-up of products, and either you plan at the individual products, or you say, right, I want 100 kits, and that 100 kits needs, each one kit needs 10 bolts, 10 screws, five panels, etc., and build it up that way. So you can choose, do I pick by bolts and screws, or just pick by kit number, and then that uses a preceding for the items within it. So yeah, we can build it up in whatever way you want. Um, you can have multiple hierarchies. Is it possible to do project-based planning? Yes. Um, I'm not just saying yes because these questions are things we can do. They are common ones. Um, we can do project-based planning. How you choose to base that, it might be milestone. It could be time-based. Uh, it could just be building up a, a project WBS. Again, you can build all of that up. It just comes down to um, how that looks for your business and how we would choose to build that up. Um, also taking a look at your NetSuite structures. But yes, fundamentally we can do project planning, but that's one where I would definitely invite uh, a follow-up to get into some more details because project planning can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but yes. A uh, final question we have currently is, once you forecast by item, can that forecast be extracted to be able to see stock on hand, sales and the forecast? That's a very good question. Yes, you can. So if you are holding inventory uh, and then modelling through your sales forecast, you're effectively building up your demand plan. So if you then look at when your sales is going out, the inventory that you have, you can then say, well, if I've got 10,000 units on hand, I'm going to sell 8,000 in January, so it's going to leave me 2,000 left in February. I've got 4,000 worth of orders for February, so I know I need to make another 2,000 order. Then you can even go so far as saying, well, I need to order 2,000. You can put in a planning product. You can say, well, what's your lead time on all of those parts? So if your lead time on your longest part is, say, five weeks, then when you've done your sales plan, you might go, oh, actually, we need to be ordering that in December. So you can actually start flagging up when you're going to run out of stock well ahead of time. So when you're doing a six-month projection on your forecast, you might be doing it now and going, oh, I've forecasted through. Ah, oh, we're going to run out of one key component for our kits, which means we won't be able to send any out in, say, March, but we know we've got a three-month lead time. So at this point, you need to be going, right, I have to raise that order in December where it doesn't land in time with me to assemble the kits to get out to customers. So yeah, that's something we, we are seeing more and more, especially around manufacturing businesses, is not just having the sales plan and the inventory, knitting the two together and helping to generate the demand plan. So then next week can take that, ingest it, and then generate, say, the work orders to then send out the, the requisitions to get that stock through. That is something we're seeing more and more, um, and we do have a solution around that. So yes, definitely get back in touch. We can take you through that. Perfect. If there are no more questions, that concludes the webinar for today. Thanks very much, John, for finally taking to walk us all through that. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, please get in touch with us here at Nobu. We'll perhaps help and get you in touch with the right people. Thanks again for your time today. Thank you for your time.